Hey everybody, welcome back. Adam Flowers here. It is Mob Vlog. We're live February February 14th, 2024. And uh, we have a great show for you guys today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Chicago mob because that's what we talk about on Mob Vlog. So welcome back, guys. It's Mob Vlog. Hey everybody, grab a coffee and cannoli. It's time for Mob Vlog with my friend Adam Flowers and Red Wamet. Mr. Wamet, how are you doing today? I'm alive. <laughs> All right. I know you had a little throat thing going there for a couple of a uh, couple of weeks now. So, but you're back, and it's uh, still going. I still got it, but it's it's not as bad. I can talk now. Before you couldn't hear my voice at all when I talked. You know, yeah, you sounded like a yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the sound that moles make. In case you guys are wondering, a mole. Okay, a mole. But never mind. <laughs> Welcome in, everybody. It's good to see you guys. <laughs> it's a normal day on Mob Vlog. What can you say? Uh, Kevin Rather, Jim Yeager, Don Chichia, Deep Porzalo, Van Pasterman, Sonny Zaro, uh, Camilio Tapia. Nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, Rhonda, good to have you with us today. David Grimp, nice welcome in. Sonny Zaro, uh, Tony Johnson, Greg, yeah, everybody's in here today. Gold glitter, gold glitter. Gold I am getter. getter, gold getter. Hey, Red, gold getter. I like that uh, little moniker, Super B. Um, <laughs> hey, John Wallace from uh, Albuquerque, Tony Johnson, Midwest Lee. How's it going, Lee? Uh, so welcome, welcome, guys. Van Pasterman, I don't want to forget leave anybody out here but leanne rolling along robert murphy catherine guerrero i uh, hope you're doing well you and uh james a allen b nice to have you in here um so guys what are we going to talk about today red and i always talk about that every week what are we going to talk about what are we going to do what are we going to do and um you know to hours of the morning to we hours of the morning we talk about what we're going to do sometimes the last sometimes. minute, the last minute Adam decides. <laughs> I go up with a lot of suggestions. Adam says, that's a great idea, but we don't do it. <laughs> hey, we're... I like that one. Let's go with it. <laughs> Floyd, we're doing good. How you doing, huh? Nice to have you in here, Floyd. Joseph, smash the like button, guys. No exceptions. Hit that like button. Don't forget to do that. So let's get this thing going. And uh, Red said to me the other day, how about I interview you a little bit, you know, about about your tour company and Frank and how, how the hell that even all happened. So, so let's do that. How did it all happen, Adam? How did it all happen? Where did they start? Where did the tour business start? Where did you start on tours or whatever? All right. So let's, let's discuss. All right. So I'm from Chicago, South side, South suburbs. I'm not really from Chicago, I'm from Calumet city, which is a little South suburb uh, right there on the border of Indiana. Um, I, I wanted to do entertainment and come to Vegas and, and do entertainment. That was my thing. And, You're a magician, uh, right? Magic and comedy. Yeah. Uh, at the time it was just magic. The comedy kind of happened later. Um, but I came out to do that and there was a tour company and it was owned by, uh, a, a gentleman, Robert Allen. And, uh, he has started a haunted Vegas tour, ghost tour, and it took off. It was a big hit. Uh, a lot of people enjoyed the the ghost tour. It was a big thing at the time. Ghost Adventures was just coming out and all. So he had it going for a couple of years. And when I moved here in 06, it was the end of 06 that Robert picked up The Battle for Las Vegas, written by Dennis Griffin. If you haven't read The Battle for Las Vegas, go read The Battle for Las Vegas. It's very, very, very good. A um, lot of great history in the book. And uh he read the book and he said, wow, all these places, uh, Bertha's Jewelry Store, Tony Roma's, all these these places are all still here in town. We should do a mob tour of Vegas to take people around. So he reached out to Dennis Griffin. Dennis said, I'm working on a new book with Frank Collada. And it's called Collada. And, uh, and so Robert learned more about this and became very intrigued and said, well. Frank's first book? Frank's first book, Collada, correct. That was that was Dennis was working on. They were releasing it. I, I believe it came out in December of 06. If I'm if I remember correctly, it was in December. The book was just coming out or January. Matter of fact, as a matter of fact, 
this picture, which I put in the thumbnail today, let's pull that photo up. Um, that is taken in 07. That's at the um, a library here in Vegas. And that, starting in the back row from the left, is Robert Allen. He is the creator of the tours. Uh, then Jack Hayden. Jack was a, some of you know that are regulars on the show, we've interviewed Jack. And uh, he was also an entertainer. And uh, Peter Lawford was one of his best friends. And he has a lot of insight into the Marilyn Monroe murder, things that Peter told him. So we've interviewed him. That's Jack, though. He was a tour guide. And then that's me on the right in the back there. The front row, starting on the left, that is Dennis Arnoldy, former special agent Arnoldy. Uh, and then Dennis Griffin there in the center. And far right is Frank Collada. And that's Frank without a goatee. And uh, this was before Family Secrets, right? This was during. This picture was taken during. This was around... Uh, like I said, 06, if my memory serves me correct, this is like a beginning of 07. It might've been in the summer of 07. So, but this is a few months after I started working for the company. And here's the thing, Robert said to me, you know, Adam, you're from, uh, the, you know, South side and you sign, you got a Chicago accent and the, the mob tour would be a good fit, you know, have you as a tour guide. So we started doing the tour and Robert would have meetings. We have meetings, monthly meetings, and he'd tell us all about the things he was learning about, you know, finding out about this and that. And he would tell us also how he was creating things. And what he did was he made a deal with Dennis Arnoldy, Dennis Griffin and Frank Collada across the front row there. And uh, they would each get a very small percentage of the ticket sales for the tour. And in exchange, they would be consultants for the tour. And he could use their names in the advertising and whatnot. And that was the, that was the deal. And so um, for years, that's what happened. A couple of years in, I was doing a tour. Had um, got a call that You were morning. doing a tour as what? Doing the mob tours. Yeah? As doing the mob. a tour guide? As a tour guide, correct. Yeah, I was giving the tours, hosting it. Uh, at the time, we had a 27-passenger bus. And uh, that night... Robert called me, uh, he called me in the, the day before and he said, hey, tomorrow I'm going to be out of town. If Frank ever came on the tours, Robert would do them. Robert would tell me you got the night off and he would do the tour. Even though I felt I did it better than Robert, that was my own opinion, you know, because I did it and I did it every night. So I had it, I had it down, the script down. And Robert just kind of ad-libbed as he went along. So, which wasn't bad. He was very entertaining. He was, he, he, was, he was very entertaining. So whatever, you know, but he would always say to me and he liked to do him. He, he liked to, he was an entertainer with hell, man. He's a ham just like me. So, um, he called me and he said, Frank Collada is going to be on the tour. Tomorrow. Listen, I'm not going to be in town. You got to do it. Don't do any jokes, Adam. Don't do any jokes. <laughs> So the irony of this is it's just astounding, the irony of this, okay? So Frank Collada is on board with NBC Dateline or ABC Dateline, whatever network it is. But I think Frank Collada did not like jokes. No, he didn't like jokes. He didn't like joking around, especially about this subject matter, okay? Because it wasn't – it was something that he, he was very serious about. And, um, you know, our – I mean, for instance, the Gold Rush jewelry store in Las Vegas that Tony Spilatro ran. They used to bring things in from consignment in Chicago, and that's what they would sell in the jewelry store. Okay. The hole in the wall gang reselling goods at the jewelry store never happened. All right. That'd be stupid. Somebody in town, you rob them, and then they walk in the jewelry store and see their stuff. You're in trouble. Stupid. You wouldn't do that ever. But. I had a little joke and the joke, actually Robert came up with the joke and it was, you know, there's where Tony Spilatro's old jewelry store was the gold rush. His motto was, if you like buying it the first time, you're going to love buying it the second time. <laughs> anyway, so I did a couple of jokes with Frank on board and um, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was when I held up the book Collada. And I said, this book right here is written by Dennis Griffin. And he lost his shit. He stood up, started screaming at me in the middle of the middle of the tour, mind you. OK, right up the aisle. You and I are going to fucking straighten some shit out. You fucking understand me. And I don't know. He's screaming at me. I'm like, oh, my God. Even though I'm still like, you know, a foot taller than the guy. I'm like, this guy's screaming at me. And he used to kill people. You know, like, this is good. <laughs> this is bad. 
And um, anyway, he got off the bus right there at the, the jewelry store in front of Bertha's little Tower of Jewels. And got out with the crew, camera crew and all, off the bus. So, uh, and so uh, I looked at the people on the bus and I said, I hope that you, uh, hope you enjoy uh, the rest of this tour. It's probably my last tour. <laughs> Gabby, how you doing, man? It's good to see you. Ryan Brown, hope you're well. Um, it's nice to see all of you guys. They fenced the stuff in New York. They they melted the mountings and reset the diamonds. Yeah, this, they, all that stuff, that jewelry. So anyway, it was a joke, okay? So I did a few jokes, and Frank is getting pissed and finally got off the bus after screaming at me. The next day, Robert called me and said, Frank's on his way back to California. See, Frank lived in Southern California. I don't know if all of you know, but he was a limo driver. And he was under his alias, Joseph Curtis, but he drove a limo. And that was his that was his deal. That's what he did. And he had some pretty good for a living. Yeah, it was pretty good living, too, I guess. You know, it was wasn't a, wasn't a bad living. And you know, your own your own boss, your own your own boss. Yeah. So which that's something I like. I hate working for people. God, man, if I had to go punch a clock, I'd shoot myself in the head. <laughs> I, I would. I, I would. I really would. Um I could never do that. I have a lot of respect for people that do, though. Don't get me wrong, because that's, I just couldn't. I'm the not, heart of America. Yeah, I'm not built that way. You're not built that way, are you? No, never that, was. That just couldn't do it. So I also couldn't do bad things, though, either. I, I'm not going to do illegal stuff to make a living. Either. That's not That's not me uh, either. Um, You're not a thief. No, no, a thief. I believe in, you know. Honest days work, honest days pay, you know, and the harder you work, the more you should make. And there's no such thing as having too much money. That's bullshit. <laughs> oh, you have more money than you need. <laughs> who, who needs $4 million when they retire? Well, you know, who doesn't? Okay. Let me go ask my buddy Jack, who's getting $1,170 social security every month. And that's what the guy's living on right now at age 89. God bless the guy. Anyway. So Robert called me the next day and said, you can't do the tour anymore, the ghost tour. Well, okay. Or the mob tour. You could do the ghost tour once a week. That was Jack's gig, ghost tour. He did that every day. Anyway, I, uh, I started bartending. Started bartending right there at the Royal Resort where the tour. Hey, wait, you were fired? From What's that? that? What's that? Did, uh, Art tell you, uh, did he tell you you were fired from that tour? Yeah, uh, Robert told me, he said, I can never, uh, I can't have you do the tour anymore, Adam. Did he tell you why? He said, he said, Frank gave him an ultimatum. He said, if you have that kid doing the tour anymore, I'm not going to be a consultant. I'm not going to be part of the, you can't, you know. So that was, that was it. And Robert said, I can't have you. Which years later, <laughs> four days before Robert died, I was sitting, he knew he was dying. And you know what he said to me? Robert said to me, you know, one of my biggest regrets, Adam, was not standing up to Frank Collada and telling him that you were the best tour guide, hands down. So it's crazy that he said that to me. That'll always stick with me. Um, well, so Robert, a reason for why things happen the way they did, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. There's a reason why everything happens. And people say that. I don't know if it's really true. So, uh, Robert Adam, when you were a bartender, did you drink more than you served? <laughs> I spilled more than I drank. I could. <laughs> Brown, thanks, man. I remember when Frank apologized to Adam for being short tempered with him and said, if I ever do that again, I'll punch myself in the face on camera and then said, Frank, I love you. Oh, you said, Frank, I love you. Well, you know, yeah, it was. Um, well, let's get to that. Let's let's not jump ahead in the story here. <laughs> Ryan. Uh, it's on, not on camera. No, I know I got it. I got it. Yeah, I fixed your corrections. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, so uh, I started doing magic. That's when I went on and did America's Got Talent and worked at the MGM and the Valleys and the and, and Fremont Street. That Fremont was the Street, the cigarette. <laughs> You're known for the cigarette. The most fun I ever. I just was down there to see my buddy Mike Hammer perform he's he's the best magic show in las vegas hands down mike hammer at the four queens he's the don rickles of magic the guy is hilarious I, I love him um 
Yeah, I just saw just saw him. I was out there, and some kid came walking up to me. I say kid, he's like 20, 21 years old. Oh my god, you're the cigarette guy. I watched you when I was a call. I wanted to do is come out here and do what you did. It's like that's crazy, crazy shit. Yeah, anyway. So while I did magic, I also, as you guys know, have a passion for video editing. I like to edit and I like to create videos and I, I, it's something I love doing. And Robert saw that in me and he used me to make videos. He'd hire me to, can you, anytime he needed a change in the tours, he'd say, hey, can you make me a new, new disc? At the time, we still had the, the DVDs. And, um, oh, okay, yeah, sure. I just made the, and then he came to me in 16 and he said, and this is the funny thing about this. Back in 05, 06, uh, sorry, 06, 07, when I was doing the tours, I said to Robert, you know, there's this thing called MySpace, and we should be a MySpace page for the tours. And look what I created, and we'll pass this around. And so um, Pete Dokus, 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 sorry Dukas. if I got the name wrong there. Dukas. Dukas, Dukas probably. Uh, Adam, do you remember doing your show at Bookies? Holy shit. Bookies, man. Yeah, that was, <laughs> hope all's well, man. I hope all's well with you too. Bookies, Jesus. That's a that's a lifetime ago. That's over 20 years ago that I did that. Bookies. That's over in Indiana, I think, if I remember right. I forget where all those bars are now. Uh, it's been so long. Anyway, so, um, we're, you know, doing helping Robert with the tours. And, and I always said to him, I said, man, you should advertise. You know, it's like casino locations. No, no, I don't want any problems with Universal Pictures. You know, you don't understand. Copyright infringements, this, that. I don't want any problems. Oh. 2016, he calls me. Hey, I got this great idea. I'm going to make the Frank Collada Casino Tour. I'm going to advertise. It's all the filming locations for casino. I'm like, well, Robert, that's what I said. You should have done. You, what? you know. <laughs> anyway. Robert was funny. It always had to be his idea. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I made the DVD and I asked him, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to run it every other week, twice a month. It's going to go out and Frank's going to move to town and he's going to be on the tour. And there's a lot of pictures of Robert and Frank doing the, the tour together. He's going to move from California to Las Vegas. That's right. He That's right. He moved. I think at the time, Dennis Griffin was living here in town and had a had a modular home across town and um worked the deal out with frank and frank moved in i think got some of denny's furniture and was that a single wide or a double wide double double okay. yeah um i'll never forget the streets all had had names like uh whiskey avenue bourbon way rum <laughs> gin I mean, they were all little alcohol names in that little uh subdivision area i thought that to be odd it's just, I don't know why that sticks with me, but it does. Anyway, um, it tells you about the neighborhood. No, well, it was on. A, it was over by Boulder. You know, in the it's kind of the little seedier area, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Jack lived over there too, not far. So Denny gave this to him. I I don't know what exactly their deal was, um, but I think it was Denny's. And this, like, I remember him telling me he used to get. Um, he used to get um, some of the furniture and whatnot was given to him by Dennis. So, ah, just, you know, he was moving to Florida. I think he had a place in New York, Florida, and Vegas that Denny would bounce around. So, um, we know how Frank got his furniture. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Chronic. Right. Of course, you got it. It, right. Um, <laughs> so... So the tour companies kept going, and uh, and and they were doing the tours every other week. Now, this is kind of funny how this happened now. So Robert's advertising the tours, and uh, the Frank Collada Casino Tour, producing it, advertising it, marketing it, spending all the money to promote it. And Robert started doing some traveling around, oh, through the end of 16 into 17, or through the, through the sorry, through the end of 16, because he, he passed away in October of 16, um, 15, 16. It was like 14, 15, 16 that ran. But that last year, he did a lot of traveling. And Frank would um, have the, the girl work for Robert. If people called, wanted to do the tour, but the tour wasn't running that week, say, hey, Frank will do a private tour for you. Same price. It was 150 a person, which I thought was kind of ridiculously low at the time, but... 
all the other tours like a hundred bucks. So I guess this being 150 was an exception. Anyway, he would do them on the side, a little cash deals. And he would kick Becky back a little commission for sending people. Robert passed away. And, um, and I thought long and hard about the tour company and thought, you know, it's probably going to just go away. But nobody runs it. And I think Robert, I talked to his widow and, um, she said, you know, I think that Robert would, would want you to be the one to take it on. So, so I, um, made a deal and, um, and, and bought the, the tours and then partnered up with another producer. He produces the, the um, well, he produced the world's greatest magic show, MJ Live and uh, the Rat Pack show. And we thought the Rat Pack oh, would be a great, 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 great marriage right there. Boom, you know, and let's do a deal where they do the, the tour dinner and show and come put together. It was great, good, good idea. So when the papers were signed, I looked at Deborah and I said, so, how about you call Frank up <laughs> and tell him what just happened? Give him the news. I'm his boss now. It, it was it was kind of a it was kind of a eh. hey, remember me? <laughs> you know, it was one of those just kind of like never thought that was gonna happen. And uh right away, Frank, oh yeah, yeah I remember you. So I want to meet with you. You know, let's go have lunch tomorrow. Okay. And the first meeting, our first talk. I said to him, you know, Frank, you could be doing so much uh, more. You know, you're, you're Frank, you're fr my exact words were, you're Frank fucking Colada, okay? You charge $150 a couple, or $150 a person, $300 a couple. Could charge twice that. No, nobody's going to pay that. Yeah, we could charge twice. I could sell it easily a couple on your tour easily five hundred dollars no nobody's gonna pay that now he was living in vegas at this time he was living here yes okay okay so nobody's gonna pay that i said look i'll sell it and but if i'm saying the price you got to say the same price if somebody calls you you've got to say the same price well about a week in i got a phone call we just started advertising it online and I sold a Sprinter party bus for know, two $2,000 and it was six people. And, um, said to Frank here, this is what we got. No way, no way. I said, yeah, so you could sell these for more. Well, a month later, I get a call from a lady. I got a call. I'd like to book that for my husband. And I said, not a problem. It's $500, man. Sure thing. Boom, boom, boom. Ran the credit card. Man, about six hours later, I had a call back from the woman. You thieving son of a bitch! You're trying to charge me $500! I just booked a tour with Frank and it's only $300! You're a da -da 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 -da. I want my money back. Oh, oh shit. He I'll cut his own throat. <laughs> I'll refund this lady. I called him up and I said, listen, you ever say $300 again, we're done. Like, this is over. Because... I just had to refund a woman, cost you an extra hundred and cost me an extra hundred because you said three after I had her $500 in the pocket. What? I said, you got to say five, Frank. You can't, there's no more three. I'm telling you it's five. We can't give different prices. Like this is what's going to happen. So he started saying five and the money went up and, um, uh, at this time, had you done any coffee or colada yet? Or no, any? no, no, no. This was this was the only thing we had done up until this point, which was right, right there in seventeen, was the Las Vegas Mobster, which we filmed that over. It we rented, I don't know, three four K cameras. It was a three camera shoot. Photographer, lighting guy, got Dean Martin's old dressing room, and that's where we shot it. It's roughly a ninety minute interview. After it was edited down ninety minutes, but. Um, yeah, this was a 90 minute interview. And and that was what we were gonna sell that DVD. Again, this is when people are still apt to buy DVDs. Nobody wants a DVD anymore. No. Sell it. I mean, just books are hard to sell. I mean, unless you're it's autographed, and yeah, that's why they want it. So so that's what we did. 
we made that um, DVD. And uh, I said, look, start doing keynote speaking engagements, all kinds of things. And we did. We had one of the, one of the, one of the ones we booked for. I did an interview with him on stage. It's pretty old. Um, 17, I want to say is right when we did it. It was in the beginning of 17. The best heart doctors in the world, the best heart surgeons. I shook hands with the guy who did the first baboon, in, you know, baboon heart and the little girl. Remember that? Back yeah. in that doctor I shook hands with him I mean it was just this, this, this was like the best heart doctors in the world at this convention at the four seasons and they want Frank <laughs> they wanted to do the mob tour and then they wanted Frank to do a keynote speaking where he would talk about how the mob work together as a team to get a job done just like surgeons work together as a team in the operating room to get a job done now somehow I had to tie that shit together which is just a weird weird tying together but we we made it work Kind of team building. It was a team building type thing. Kind of, yeah. That, that's what they wanted us to tie to. But we did we did our best. Greg Polly, how you doing? Um, Holman Sanders, nice to have you in here, guys. So uh just bring you up to speed. We're talking about how the tour company and how Frank uh and I started to to work connected, yeah. so and connect. So so that's how that happened. Um, and how the company switched over. Now at that point that point i wanted to help frank make as much money as possible the guy was older i knew he was on oxygen it's like uh, did you know he was terminal no he never he didn't not, he didn't tell me that he didn't tell me he was stage he was diagnosed stage four copd in 16 i want to say is when they diagnosed him but he didn't tell me that until was he diabetic then yeah oh i'm sure yeah I'm sure he was. Um, Had he seen that heart doctor yet? The, 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 no, the, the, the congestive heart failure was the other thing, you know, that he'd been diagnosed with. I didn't know what stage, but, you know, the doctors told him you got a few years. Okay. That's because that's what that prognosis is. So it's what it is. I'll tell you the date. <laughs> it is what it is, man. It's what, how it's just life, you know? So when we started working, um, we, so, so, Let's go back to the tours. It was around 19, in, in 2019, uh, Valuetainment, YouTube, had Frank on and did an interview. And my tour and froze up. Oh, sorry. Uh, Valuetainment did an interview in 2019 and had Frank on the interview. He was interviewing all the mobsters, you know, it was Michael Francis and Sammy DeBull and uh, Gianni Russo, all these guys. And uh, it got a million and a half views, that video interview. And my tour guides were saying to me, guys that were working for me, like, hey, did you see Frank's interview? Hey, did you see Frank's interview? And I'm like, hey, what, what, what are you guys talking about? It's on YouTube, man. You got to watch his interviews on YouTube. It's really, it's gotten a million views. It's got a million views. So I went and looked at it, and um, the gears are turning in my head. And Frank's telling me, my phone won't stop ringing. And I thought, holy shit. You know, we ought, to, we ought to just do this on our own. That's what we should do. Fuck trying to get on other channels. Let's just start our own. And that idea came in December of 19. And that's when I picked That's your idea. Actually, it, the the idea was because um, you know how to produce it. The, the idea was how to, much, how to even go on YouTube. Did he? No, 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 no. no didn't had, had no idea. Um, my idea was let's start a YouTube channel that would promote the tours. It would be advertising for the tour company. Do we do a ghost channel? Do we do a mob? Channel? What do we do? And it was actually my wife who said one night. We're sitting there and uh, talking, and she just blurted out coffee with colada. And I went, oh, I'm like dynamite. The next day, I was at Frank's, and I said, let's start this channel up. And Frank said, oh, well, all right, you know. And so we started the video that day, and I uploaded it, and it got a couple of views. And then I did another one and another one and another one. And uh, You're and primitive back then. Very primitive. What was that's, primitive? Before you had the, that's before you had the intro with... Kalada, Kalada. 
Uh, that all came later, the jingle and all that. I, I even wonder if it was worth the time. But uh, honestly, you know what people kept saying? It damn thing, man, that song stuck in my head. I catch myself humming it in the middle of the day. And uh, yeah, it was kind of a catchy, you know, I don't know. I thought it was kind of a catchy thing. And I didn't see anybody else doing anything like that. Uh, you know, it's very innovative. Nobody did anything like that. No, no, you know, and then the little moniker, little cartoon Frank, you know, it made him look, how does it say this? It made him look like this gentle, old, nice guy. It did. It gave him a soft because it was a cartoon of him. You see? Not the kind of guy that would tell somebody else to slash your tires. See what I mean? Like this is the kind of this is the kind of guy. I swear, man, the girl that was working for me at the time, she was twenty one. Okay. I don't think she was twenty one at the time. She answered the phones and she's the one who actually did the did the drawing. And uh we I took her with to lunch one day with Frank. She wanted to meet him. I wanted to meet Frank. Okay, so took her with. We get done with lunch. She's like, he's like this this old like grandfather you want to sit down and have lunch with, you know? Like he's like the nicest old little, you know, guy, you know. And I'm like, Morgan, you know what, you know, what the guy did, right? <laughs> you know who he is. And she said, I know, but you know, he's just this, he's just nice, you know. Okay. And that's that's how the whole thing came off. It was like People like that. It was chronic smoke. That was a great image of him. Thank you. That's why we left it as the as the thing. You know, we we copy wrote it and uh, and um, you know left it as our as a channel moniker. I mean, that's it's a logo. Yeah, it's a it's a logo, and no nobody's gonna forget that. I mean, it's it's just that's what it is. So it's the channel. Yeah, and it's and it's something that um, you know something that that it's memorable. So, um, Tim Peroni, I think Frank's personality and your personality went to the great success you guys had. Uh, you know, <laughs> Tim, I wanted to I'm do for him. I'm going to answer for him. My opinion is it was Adam's hard work and his personality that held it together. And it was a fine class of gum, chewing gum. That held it together because it wasn't easy you know it, it was here's here's what happened we started that thing i didn't know that pandemic was coming i didn't know the whole fucking strip was gonna shut down come on you know I, dude, wait you tell me they're gonna turn a slot machine off in las vegas i'd have laughed at you they ain't ever gonna turn a freaking machines off those machines have been on for 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 70 years they aren't turning them off Okay, there's no way in hell they're gonna shut down willingly shut down machines, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, we're shutting down machines." We're like, what the fuck is that? Was the nuttiest thing, man. That's but I don't have to explain. We all went through it. Um, some just experienced it a little more than others. You know, some people it didn't affect in one bit. You know, they just went about their jobs and about their lives, and and it didn't affect them at all. I I was there. I. I it didn't affect me. We didn't have to wear masks. We didn't have to wear masks in Florida. You're in Florida. Yeah, you're in Florida, right? So, land of the free. Oh yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So, uh anyway, that was that that was how that started and I I don't, you know, That's when you started talking. The, the, here's the other thing that happened. So, it was around March when everything was shutting down that Frank started opening up to me more about his health. And what was going on with him and i started to tr literally try to help my, my wife and i we got books we got all kinds of things for people with copd diet has a lot to do with actually reverse some of the uh symptoms of copd and whatnot and tried everything you know to to help in in whatever ways and uh that we could and i was over there a lot and what when i wasn't there working on it with him then I was at home editing, you know, and sitting there writing comments and replying to people and then calling Frank up going, hey, they asked this question. What do I, you know, what do you want to say? You know, and I would sit there and I type everything and and uh, I, people thought it was Frank replying to him. I thought it was Frank. I thought it was Frank. You thought it was Frank talking to me. Yeah, I know. It was me. And I even told Frank, I'm like, who's this wise ass, this Red Womet guy, you know? <laughs> oh, he owned a porn shop or something. And he had the muscle on him. You know, it's... That's about all I know, you know. 
Okay, well, because he's making comments. I'm just wondering if he, you know, I don't know if I looked at your channel at that point and saw your bedtime stories. I might have, and I might have showed him one of them. I don't remember. time I asked, uh, because you talked about the Grand Avenue crew, and I asked him things, or I asked the channel things about the Grand Avenue crew, and said, did he ever meet Frank Schweiss? I kept asking that on almost every video. Did he yeah. ever meet Frank Schweiss? Um. Yeah, that was one of the questions. I spelled his name one time, and you said the least you could possibly do, and I thought it was Frank saying it. The least oh, you could possibly right. do is spell my name right. Joe Collada, thanks, Adam. You're a truly good friend to my brother. Uh, you're welcome, Joe. And, um, you know, it wasn't something, that, again, it was surreal. It wasn't something that either of us set out to do. It just kind of happened. It clicked. As that channel grew and as the, the people started, you know, joining and subscribing and it snowballed. And then James Woods tweeted it. James Woods tweeted one of the videos out and said, oh, it's so nice to see Frank. And he helped on the movie and that. And we got a shit ton of views overnight. And I went, Frank, what the hell? I, and then I found out. Somebody wrote in the comments, hey, I heard about this because of James Woods tweeting. And I'm like, what? And sure enough. You know, that's what, so that's when I thought, holy shit, there's probably something to it. Now, God rest you his soul. From the movie Casino, where Frank was the technical advisor. Uh, exactly. That's what, that's what James Woods talked about was it was good to see Frank talking about the movie and, you know, remembering him being on the set and all. And so, so that went out and by the way, smash the like buttons, guys. Hit the like button, please. Um, over a hundred here. I know you can hit the like button. So, um, so, uh, that, that was how it kind of started. Everything shut down. I had nothing to do. I mean, the nothing to do. There, there was no tours to go do. There wasn't anything. And it was about that, that right about that time that I started kind of getting worried a little more about Frank's health. And I was like, you know, he wanted to go out and do a private tour the money was there. Now, where was he living at that time? With the people. I don't know if I want to go to the people. Um, Did he move from the trailer park? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He got it. He, he, so, so after we started doing the – when did that happen? Let's see. I remember going over and getting books from him still in 17 and probably into 18. He only moved out of that for like the last 18 months, something like that. And um, Country Club Towers, apartment 408, uh, that's where we did all the work on the channel uh, at that point. This was a nice place. He had a balcony out there. It was nice. It looked uh, nice. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I thought, you know, the idea, the whole idea of starting the thing and documenting everything was because we would get done with tours and Frank would go, let's go to the pepper mill, go have lunch. Okay. <laughs> We'd sit, have coffee, then lunch, and he'd just tell me story, 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 story about the mob. And I'm going, Frank, I read all your books. None of this stuff's in any of the books. And it's story, story, story. And I said, we got to document this somehow. How do we document this? And because um, they're going to be gone. The stories are gone. Once the person's gone, that's it. So how do you do it? And I couldn't think of anything faster than... All right, tell me the story, you know. And then it was get some lighting equipment, get some more lighting equipment, get some, let's put up multiple cameras, let's do, you know, do angles on this thing. Let's, you know, let's, let's, you are a producer. Produce this fucking thing, you right? Are a, you are a producer. Let's start, yeah, let's, let's, let's start, you know, let's start building something that's going to be, you know, really, really cool. Um, and it did. And then when Frank went in the hospital, We all went in the hospital, the COVID. My mom, my dad, Frank, me, everybody's in the hospital. I was only there for a few hours. They sent me home. But even when I picked up Frank on the 4th of July, I had a Tower of Jewels face mask on. When he got in the car, Red, yeah. I looked at Frank and I pointed, 4th of July is when they got arrested, 1981. Yeah. Tower of Jewels. So I had the Tower Jewels face mask on. He got in the car and I said, you want to make a stop on the way home? You fucking jag off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That was funny. He lost his sense of humor. <laughs> well, no, it's you know, here's what the, the funny part of this whole story is. Okay, the the irony, not the funny part, because there's funny parts, but the irony of the whole damn thing is, Red. You know why I got fired from doing the tours? Because sure. I tried, I set out to make Frank Collada laugh. He doesn't laugh. The last thing that I did was make Frank Collada laugh. Oh, wow. That was the last moment before he passed that I made him laugh. Wow. Because hmm? when you're laying there and you're on your way out, little bit of little bit of comedy doesn't hurt you know what i mean like fuck always, for, for you folks out there that are listening adam always tries to make me laugh he's oh. always, and just in the beginning you said that one went over your head well you made a noise and i said everybody that's what a mole sounds like because you're an fbi mole in the mole and the thing and that was the joke so anyway sometimes i gotta explain the jokes to red <laughs> all the time that's all right. That's all right. He didn't like my peekaboo joke. I told him, I said, on average, 32 people a year go to the ICU because of injuries due to uh, playing peekaboo. You know, they end up in the hospital for that. Most of them end up in the ICU. I see you. Peekaboo, I see, I see you. Oh, right. The words, I see These are really bad. These are really, really, really bad. Some of them I joke. So, BSJ, you're a great guy, Adam. Thanks for the great channel. You're welcome, Brady. And thanks for coming out here and doing the tour, too. Uh, I appreciate that. You know, a lot of you guys have come out and, and done the tour. And that's why we still do the channel, because uh, it advertises the tours. Which, by the way, if you haven't been, you need to come do the Vegas Mob Tour. I mean, it's a really, really, really cool tour. Join us for the Vegas Mob Tour. Experience Sin City's dark past. Learn how Bugsy Siegel built the Flamingo. Find out who killed him and why. Hear who Jimmy Hoffa supplied money to back in the 50s. Visit the actual home used in the 1995 blockbuster movie Casino and other filming locations as well. See the real jewelry store where Frank Collada and his crew were busted. Sit in the exact spot where Frank Lefty Rosenthal's car was bombed back in 82. View never before seen footage of Frank Collada telling personal stories about Tony Spilatro, Joey the Clown Lombardo, and the Hole in the Wall Gang. This is how serious we thought he saw. Sounds like a peach color. It was brown then. The only thing changed is the driveway. Here's an offer you can't refuse. Upgrade to the Untouchables experience. Following the tour, you'll enjoy a three-course dinner at the Tuscany Gardens and then VIP seating for the long-running hit, The Rat Pack is Back Show. Experience Vegas, the way it was meant to be. Yeah, so, you know, Red, that, that's the thing. Vegas, the way it's meant to be. Not this bullshit corporations right now. Don't even tell you how much the rooms cost until you get to town. Unbelievable. Tell me how much the room is before I get to Las Vegas. People, when I tell them that on the tours, they're like, yeah, yeah. What the what the hell? You know, it's supposed to be $169 a night. It says here, why is this bill here say $325? And the resort and fees and, and everything else. Resort fee, sir. And there's a fee to walk down the hallway. And there's a fee to ride our elevator. And then there's a fee on the fee. And we tax the fee. And that's how we go, fuck you. Tell me how much the room is. And there's no free drinks. There's no comp drinks. Oh, man. You know, it's to be. It's gone. It's crazy. Parking. You got to pay to park now in the parking garage. Like, well, they, that's not Vegas, guys. So, anyway, let's get I back to the big signs up. It says free parking this way. Start off. Oh, man. <laughs> Every casino was free. You're going in to give them your money. Why are they going to charge you to park your car? They want you to park your car. Come on in. Give us your money, right? <laughs> I mean, the, what the Vegas, that's not Vegas. That's just not. So no, it was meant to be different. It was it was meant to be a lot different. So Red, is that your Super Bowl ring? No. <laughs> I oh, know. that's the ring you're selling. Everybody, Red's got a ring up for sale. <laughs> I saw you put it on Facebook. You're, you're selling it, right? Yeah. That's awful. I never oh, wear yeah. it, Adam. I didn't wear it out by you. Would you would you steal that from Liberace? No. <laughs> 
I call it my gaudy ring. Somebody <laughs> asked me on Facebook. They said, is that a pinky? Is that a pinky, really? A pinky ring. And I said, no, not hardly. No, no. Okay. Huh? Um, so. Thank, thank you for uh, that smoke. You made me laugh. I was never in the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Next year's 30th anniversary of the movie Casino. That is right, 2025. It'll be uh, 50, uh, 30, 30 years. 30 years, man. I remember when I saw that movie when it came out, I didn't have shit about the mob in Chicago. It's funny, I worked in all these restaurants that ended with I's and E's and vowels, you know. Lauren Zetti's. <laughs> um now, I'm not saying they were, but the people who came into these places, you know, they were. I mean, they, everybody's got to eat. They were what? Oh, there were guys that were connected that would come in and out of these places. Okay. You know, I mean, it, it was, I was a kid. I wasn't, you know what I mean? I just, but I knew, you know, you watch the money going around and, and whatnot. Well, I mean, yeah, and you see rings like that. That's for Big Tuna. What's what? Big Tuna asked ask for that in the comments. Oh, okay, gotcha. Big Tuna. All right, get a close-up of the ring. There you go. That's how many, times, how many times does that thing have on it? 18? No, there's a, a row of the three across, 12, 12 in the center. Yeah. And then three on each side. They're all at the 0.25. Uh, 18. Stone is 0.25 carats. 18 diamonds. Wow. So... Anyways, for those of you interested, Red's trying to sell it. So. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, um, 17, 18. You're right. <laughs> of course I'm right. I'm always right. Yes. Gary, Mush <laughs> Gary Mushinsky. Best show in a long time. Glad that you're enjoying it, Gary. Just trying to be real here. And uh, and and I'm always asking Red the questions. And he said, let me ask you some questions as to how the hell and why you're doing what you're doing and, and how you've gotten to where you are so far. And I thought, well, why not? I mean, it's, and you guys can guys can ask questions too if you'd like. You know, it's fine. Um, Frank was still, um, mm, he was still sick when I picked him up on the 4th of July. Um, he was still sick. And. But you drove him home. I did. I got him home. And then I, I, that was when he yelled at me. If you remember when he yelled at me about one, two, three, I said three, what the, you know, and he, I was going to edit that out, and I, I don't know why I left it in there. I just went, you know, I'm going to leave it in there. People see, you know, see what I, I, I'm i dealing with. to see what you had to deal with. It's like kind of behind-the-scenes <laughs> stuff. Everybody likes to see some of that, you know? So that's, that's why I left it in. There were things I cut out that I still have that, you know, like, us starting one of the videos. This is like in the first two months. I was starting a video with Frank. And I forgot to mic him. And so we started the thing. All right, welcome back. It's coffee with Kalati. He's got his mug and he starts in on the story. And I go, oh, sh Frank, stop. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I forgot to mic you, you know, and I'm my, like, oh, all right, you know, you know, mic'd him. And then, all right, let's get started and we start again. And he gets 10 seconds in and I'm like, oh, I forgot to hit record on the thing. Adam, you got to stop doing I can't keep going, to, you know, and. Well, he's got his oxygen too. Sometimes he wouldn't have his oxygen on. He'd take it off. Oh, he took his oxygen off. I talked him into wearing the oxygen a few months, and I said, "Frank, just be just be real." I said, "Put the oxygen on." I said, "If you wear the oxygen, you just tell the people, look, I got to wear oxygen. They're going to respect you more for that anyway, and you will live longer if you don't keep taking it off." You know? So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a reason the doctor tells you to keep it on all the time. So. Tommy Bridges, I met Frank when I was building the mob experience at the Tropicana in the basement. Randy Premetz, my local AV guy, was installing my gear. You know, it's so funny, Tommy, that you're involved with that because when I got fired from doing the mob tour in, oh, eight. must have been in the middle of nine, somewhere in nine, oh, nine. Do you know where I went? Tommy, I went to, I called up Jay Bloom. That's when I first met Jay. And I said, hey, 
I do the Vegas Mob Tour, and I understand you're opening a mob experience, and maybe you need a curator, you need some kind of host or something, and, you know, I'd love to to be a part of that, and I uh, have a little bit of knowledge, at least the stuff I've learned in the last couple of years, and, uh, and, and he did. Jay said, come on down, let's meet, let's talk, and, uh, and, and we talked for a bit, and then, um, and then, um, he introduced me to Millicent Siegel, to Bugsy's daughter. And that's when I met Millicent. That was because of Jay. That was pretty damn cool. Um, that was a pretty cool experience. Anyways, Tommy, you must have known Jay as well. Um, he was supposed to be in that, uh, in that pod, was, came close to being in that pod, in that Titan, with uh, with that uh, Rush Stockton, Stockton, Stockholms, what was his name? Something, Stockton Rush was his name. Stockton Rush. Anyway, <laughs> Jay was supposed to be in that thing with him. Ooh. Help us out, Tommy. That's all it was. Yeah. So, um. Anyway, that that back to let me let me finish this story up because we're running short on time here. But, uh, to, to to finish it up, to finish it up, um, the 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 man needed help, and he. He needed help. He needed somebody. He didn't have anybody that was that was there. He had no family here. He didn't. Uh, besides Lewis, which you guys know, Lewis, Lewis. Yes. He had Lewis, but Frank and him were a little upset, or Frank was a little upset with Lewis, or I can't remember why, but he was a little upset with him, and uh, probably some petty shit, you know. But uh, yeah. You know, he he needed help. And then, uh, you know, the very last thing before he went back into the hospital on the 23rd, I believe, it was the 23rd of July. It was oh, he's home from the 4th to the 23rd. On the 22nd, I told him, you got to go back to the hospital, Frank. I said, your kidneys aren't working right. I don't think people understand how you actually were kind of a caregiver to him. I mean, you really kind of took care of him because there's nobody around. So, um, did you go over and check on him and everything else when he had COVID when he came home? So, look, those three weeks were rough weeks. Okay, okay. that was, Frank needed help, and I was going through a lot of shit, guys, because my father passed away too that same week. It was Frank got home, I got him home. And then I made a video with him and I was working on the video. And then my, my dad passed away on the ninth. And I sat with my mom for a couple of days. And then I got worried about Frank. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm worried about this, this old, this old mobster. But he's to me, he's this old guy that needed help. That's what he was. So I went over and that's when he, my ass hurts, you know, and <laughs> ass hurts because he'd been laying in that hospital bed for bed sores. <laughs> he had bed sores, and uh, and so I was getting bandaged. I got him a little too. Uh, I still have the, the I still have that stupid donut, little donut, you know, inflatable donut. To sit on. On. <laughs> yeah, got that, and then it was it was getting bed sore, changing bandages, you know. And Frank was just, it was kind of. I'll, I'll be honest, you know, he just said to me. He looked at me and said, I, I, I don't care. And there, goes, says, there goes my dignity out the door. It's exactly what it was. He goes, I he can't goes, take care of my own ass, so he's going to have to take care of it for me. <laughs> he said to me, he's like, I don't care. Like, all the dignity out of it. I said, drop your drawers. Let's get this, you know. And I get down, I'm changing the bandage on him. And uh, <laughs> Frank said, Adam, Adam, Adam told me, I don't know if he's going to tell you folks. He, he I'm gonna tell you what I did. He's just buck cheek. He's a cute, and he <laughs> looks around. I, 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 I'm the bandage. I can't remember. I give his ass a little pinch, and I said, "Oh, well, sexy ass!" And <laughs> <laughs> I jumped. And he looked back. And goes, "Don't be getting horny back there." <laughs> but when you're in that awkward situation, you gotta make jokes. Cuts up. That cuts up things. It makes it good. How, do you, how else do you deal? You know. And then when he said to me, he's like, uh, "Would you shave me?" I never shaved somebody before. 
And I just watched Ozark. And remember in Ozark, Jason Bateman had to shade the old guy with his clippers? Yeah. So I got the clippers out and we went through that whole, you know, that whole thing. So if anybody ever asked you to shave him and you really don't want to shave him, Break out the straight razor and, and <laughs> here we go. And they'll change their mind real fast. <laughs> so um, Frank went back on the 23rd. And that morning I talked with my wife and she said, let's just move Frank over here instead of you driving back and forth, back and forth across town. It was 20, 25 minutes from his house or his apartment over to here. So, so, uh, lift chair. I asked him, I said, on the way to the hospital, I said, you want to stay with uh, Allie and I? So we'll put a lift chair in. You guys would do that? I said, yeah, Frank. He said, I'd like that. I said, okay. I said, you go in the hospital, get better, and then you can get out and come home. Can no I call wife. He said, no Adam, wife, can I no call No family, you? nothing. No he children. Said, he said, Adam, can I call your place home? And I said, yeah, Frankie. And he said, all right, I'll be. Get, I'll get out. No. Well, he did. I don't know if many people know that, but he did. Um, the chairlift was being installed. It was like the next day the chairlift was coming in. And we pretty much, it was the last thing we were waiting on. And it was like the day before they discharged him from St. Rose. And I said to him, because he, he, didn't, he didn't look good at that point. But I picked him up at St. Rose and I said to him, hey, uh, I think you need to... to I think you need to stay just at Mountain View, you know, for a couple more days, get some more strength up, you know. I said, and the chairlift will be in, and you can, you know, as soon as they discharge you, you come, come over. It'll be everything will be ready. And um, he went back in the hospital. It's, I pulled up the emergency at, at um, Mountain View, and I ran up and I said, "My uncle's in the car." I said, "He's having chest pains." I said, "I just picked him up at the, you know," and so they rushed him right in, right away, got him into a room, and um. Anyway, he asked me, he said, I want you here. It was a few days before he passed away. He said, I want you here. And I said, I'd be there right now, but they aren't letting anybody in the hospital. I couldn't even sit with my dad. And um, he said, I want you here. So um, Joe knows the rest of that story. Joe called me that morning. And uh, they wanted to start him on a... <laughs> Hold on. Perfect, perfect timing, Joe. Whoop, Joe, you there? I'm here. Could you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect timing. Yeah, yeah. I was watching the show, and that was so nice. And that's all true. Everything you did for my brother. I mean, I wish we could have been there for him. We, you know, but he was in the hospital, and I couldn't get him to visit him there anyhow. But uh, yeah. But yeah. that was like Allie, Allie, wonderful woman. Right? It's nice taking in the, basically a perfect stranger you were taking in. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was something we were willing to do. She kept saying, we're going to have a colada Christmas. We're going to have a colada Christmas this year. Yeah. It's supposed to happen. As long as you didn't throw him in the sack like they did to him when he was a little kid. How they used to torment my brother. <laughs> Yeah. You know the Santa Claus story, right? Yeah. Yeah. You could tell him the Santa Claus story. When I, or I'll tell him when my brother was a kid, we'd have like 50, 60 people, cousins, you know, and aunts and uncles, and someone would dress up as Santa Claus, and then they'd give out gifts, and they'd always tease my brother the aunts. they go, Frankie was a bad boy. Frankie's a bad boy. So Santa Claus said, well, I'm going to bring him back to the North Pole. And he was only like about seven years old. They threw him in the sack, the sack that the toys were in. Oh. And he started kicking and fighting. And then my father I wasn't there. I wasn't born yet. And my father's like, quit fucking tormenting my son. Because he was my father's pet, you know. Yeah. And that's, that's true. Yeah, you know, Fr man. Frank hated Santa Claus. Yeah, well, because he fucking tormented him all this. I think he, my brother, I think he believed in Santa Claus till he was 13 years old. Wow. <laughs> because he was fucking beat up by the guy. <laughs> you know, time of year again. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. 
Oh man. Hey Joe, thanks for thanks for calling in, man. And uh we gotta wrap the show, but Okay, goodbye. All right, bye. Talk to you later. All right. So that's the story, guys. And that's that. That ended right there. Okay. That's that. Adam, Adam, let's not end it right there. Let's yeah. tell the rest of the story. What happened? He got out and or he never got out. No, he went back into, I picked him up at the one hospital at St. Rose. I took him to Mountain View and uh, he was there for another two or three weeks. And on the 20th, Joe called me. Frank had a heart attack in the morning and they resuscitated him and they wanted to start dialysis. And that's when he was on a ventilator already. And they, they Joe said, I don't, they're using him as a pin cushion. And I said to him, yeah, was, you're making the right choice. His, his whole body fell apart by then. And so, um, and so the hospital called. Look, I, I called, I called, I called those nurses at that hospital uh, probably three times a day. Oh, I would ask them. I mean, I had a whole list of questions. How's his creatinine levels doing? How's his this, that? Some of the, the nurses started to think I was a doctor. Okay. They were like, are you a doctor? Are you? And I'm like, no, I'm just a friend that knows a little bit about what's going on. And you know, to keep me up to date. And, and those, those nurses, I asked, can I come in and see Frank? I said, I had COVID already. I don't know if they, you know, any exceptions. And they called that day and said, do you want to come in and see your friend? Your friend, you, well, and it wasn't, I didn't say Frank, by the way. I said Joseph, because he was Joseph Curtis in the hospital. And um, so they took me up to the ICU. Frank was behind the glass. And, uh, and it's so crazy because they walked in there. This is true. This is all true. They walked in and the nurse squeezed his shoulder and said, Joseph, Joseph, your friend Adam's here. Nothing. He just laid there, eyes closed. And she came you out. You had a wall between you, right? A glass wall? Yes, glass. She came back out through the door and she said, I'm so sorry. Your friend's become um, Come on, unresponsive. Um, no physical, verbal stimulation. And, and we're so sorry because when patients with COVID on ventilators, when they get to this point, that's it. They're, they don't respond again. And I said, I know, just went through this with my dad. Trust me. I asked the doctor because they, they were going to let me go in with sit, sit with my dad when they took him off the ventilator. And I didn't want to remember my dad that way. I just, I didn't. Now don't ask me why. But I asked the doctor, I said, what's the chances my dad opens his eyes? You take him off the ventilator and he opens his eyes and I'm not there. Is there any chance? None at all. Zero. Zero. Nothing. He's not going to open his eyes. What happened with Frank? So the nurse, she came out and said the same thing to me. She said, he's become unresponsive. I said, I know. She went through this with my dad. And then this memory hit me. This uh, memory. In 17, Frank was... Matter of fact, Joe's still watching this. You know, Joe, I, I had a freaking deja vu moment last week. I had to go visit Jack, my buddy Jack. I had to get him a new phone, his phone they put through a wash machine. <laughs> I walked into the place where he's staying, the rehabilitation place, and I got the heebie-jeebies because the nurse at the front desk, the first at the front desk, she's like, have you been here before? And I said, no, I've never been here before. And uh, she said, well, you know, walk around. I walked into the room and I went, oh, my God, I have been here before. This is where Frank was rehabbed. And that's right where I met Joe, Frank's brother, for the first time was at that trellis on paradise, Joe. That was the place. And I mean, I'm looking around going, this is where I've been here before. <laughs> I've been here before. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so Frank, Frank did a thing. He was at Sunrise Hospital in 17. And uh, I remember I was sitting in the room with Frank and a roommate guy, his name's Kevin, and um, he's a nurse. And, and I lived in the guest house of their house. And, um, years before you know, when I first moved to town back in, I don't know, 09, 10, something like that. Now it's here it is in 16, 17. And I look up, Kevin walks in the room. Kevin is Frank's nurse, Joe's nurse. Okay. He's Frank's nurse. And I went, Kevin, uh, was, was that 17 or 19? That was in 17. Oh, that's when he has heart condition. He had a lung thing going on. They had to put powder or something on his lung. It was weird with the thing they had to do. But 
Um, anyway, I said, what's up, Kevin? And after about an hour, I went out in the hallway. I was like, hey, man, like, take care of that guy. I said, that, that's Tony Spilatro's best friend. His name's Frank Collada. Kevin's a trustworthy guy, okay? I walked back in the room, and Frank looked at me and said, did you just go tell that guy who I am? Like, no, no, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> that memory hit me, and I said to the nurse, fuck it. I said, go back in the room and call him Frank. And she said, why? I said, because nobody's supposed to know his name. And if anything's going to wake him up, that's going to do it. She went in there and said, uh, this, 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 we're fast forward in 2020, right? Yeah, this is in 2020. This is Frank. Okay. Dying. Frank was dying here. She walked back because I wouldn't have told the nurse his name if he was, you know, but he was, this was it. She walked back in the room and she said, hey, Frank, boom, his eyes popped open. I said, you got to be kidding me, right? Put the phone down next to him. And I talked to him for a couple of minutes and I said, hey man, I said, you wanted me here and I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. I said, I'm um, here to tell you today's a good day. You don't have to fight anymore. Yourself, other people, you're done. You can relax. Give us some comfort. Give us some comfort. Yeah, so you can relax now. I said, and he kept asking, he asked me a few times when in the between hospital stays, he asked me at his place, he said, are you an angel? And he was, he said it with a straight face. He was serious. Like, are you an angel? And I kept laughing. I'm like, I'm your friend, Frank. So, so, uh, I said to him, I said, you keep asking me if I'm an angel. Maybe I'm supposed to be here to tell you, you're going to be okay. You're loved. I love you, Joe, Elaine, Lewis, I, all that. I named off a dozen people. And I said, you got 21,000 people on YouTube that love you at the time. It was 21,000. And um, I said, you got nothing to worry about. You told them all the bad shit you did in your life and you encouraged them to go down a better path in life and to lead a better life. So you've, who knows how many people you've affected in a good way. So don't worry. Close your eyes and go to sleep. Let when go. You, Let when go. You, when you wake up, give my pops a big hug for me. I said, and I promise I'm going to do a great job, whatever I do, in telling the story and I won't make you look like a jag off. <laughs> Maybe just a little bit, all right? And that was, that was, sorry guys. Um, and that was it. Um, uh, like I said, that was the, the last thing he, he, that he laughed at was the, maybe just a little bit, you know, and that was that. And then I stood there with those, it's just it's crazy. But anyway, that's how it happened. And uh, that's what happened. And that's how the whole damn thing and tour started and how this whole thing came to be. So, Adam, I think this is great. Thank you so much for telling everyone what it's about. Well, thanks for, thanks for, thanks for, um, suggesting that we do this because i didn't really think that this would be interesting but it looks like uh you guys did find it interesting hit the like button don't forget to do that and um would have been an honor to meet frank yeah well it was uh you guys did through youtube had it not been for this medium and the interaction of the channel and that ability you guys did get to meet him and you got to meet him for a short time and that was the whole point of this so red it's been fun but all good things must come to an end take care we'll see you next week have a good day god bless red god bless